Good morning and welcome to our session about being proud at work. Tomorrow February is LGBT History Month. I'm Claire Walker and I'm part of Bridge GM, which is at the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Meet Your Future was launched in April 2019 to enable more young people like you to meet with and have meaningful conversations with employers whilst experiencing different workplaces and environments. Over the last 12 months, we've been speaking with young people like yourselves from all across the 10 boroughs in Greater Manchester to find out how you're feeling and how you feel you should be supported now and going into your future. We've been listening and we've learned lots. We've developed a suite of information, resources and services that are there to help you. This can be found on GMAX, which is the Greater Manchester Application and Career Service. We're going to pop the GMAX link in the chat for you to see and we can cover that a little bit more later on. Many of you will, be, will already be aware of it, but if you're not, please take time to have a look at it and discuss it with your careers teacher at school. We've also adapted the Meet Your Future campaign to better fit what you've been telling us by bringing you sessions such as this one that we're doing this morning. Throughout the academic year, you'll have had the opportunity to engage with and get involved in a variety of different sessions, mainly about employers and businesses in Greater Manchester, showing you the different pathways and the vast array of career opportunities that are open to you, potentially when you leave school or when you leave college. This morning, we're really pleased to be able to be joined by Carl Austin Bean. Carl is the LGBT advisor to the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. After Carl's finished his presentation, we will have an opportunity to have some questions and answers that you can put directly to Carl. So do please pop them into the Q&A and we'll make sure that we get those covered later on. I really hope this session will inform you, inspire you and show you why you should be hopeful and optimistic about your future and all the possible opportunities available to you in the future in Greater Manchester. I'll now pass you over to Carl. Thanks, Carl. Thank you very much and good morning. So my name is Carl Austin Bean. My pronouns are he, him and his. And I'm going to give a bit of a, a backstory really of why I became an activist, but why it's also important to, to be your true self at work and so that you get the best out of yourself and, and employers get the best out of people. So I'm going to start off back in the sort of late 70s um, when I was on the picture where I'm holding the ball. I'm five years old there. And on the next picture, I'm about seven, seven, eight, seven years old. Now, I put this picture on. So I went to Crumsall Lane Primary School in North Manchester and I felt I was different. Um, and what I mean by that was I just felt that I was I, I didn't fit in with with, with with the way that society was um, at the time. And I felt I had feelings for, for other lads and I wasn't as, as um, active with, with certain aspects of, of school. So. I remember having a conversation with my mum and my mum just said it's fine you know it's just a phase it's a phase people go through and as that went on even when I went to Abram Moss uh, High School in North in North uh, Manchester I again still had these same feelings and and back then um, even though you may be different and the fact that you you know you had names called at you and yet being gay wasn't something that people could accept and it wasn't anything that you know it was a very derogatory term and people got bullied at school and people you know just because of the way that people were but thankfully um i you know i managed to sort of come through that now at school i wasn't very academic um i tried but just wasn't uh, very you know i just didn't manage to, to get up to the grades and i ended up leaving school at 16 with one gcse now when i left school even though I was going through that process of, of thinking that I may be gay, I didn't want to be gay um, because I wanted to get married and have children. Now, again, it was that whole uh, period back in the 80s when we had uh, this epidemic called HIV and AIDS. And we were told that all gay people were going to, to die of this disease. Now, I certainly didn't want to die and I certainly didn't. So, so I then um, was really struggling and with, with how I was going to come out and, and how I was going to be. We even had the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester saying that homosexually, uh, homosexual uh, is, should be illegal and referred to those with AIDS as, as uh, swirling in a, in a cesspit of our own making. So as a child, I'd always wanted to go into the fire service. Now in Greater Manchester, you had to be 21 at the time and they weren't recruiting. 
So I'd at the age of 17 and a half went over to see my brother in the RAF over in Akrotiri and I realized that they had a fire service in the fire in the RAF. So I then started the process of trying to, to join the RAF and it, it took about 18 months. And on the 20th of March 1991, I got my papers through to, to get selected to go into the RAF. And I remember telling my mum that I was going in and she was like, well, you can't because you told me that you could be gay. Because back then, being gay in the RAF was illegal. But I joined and I joined at the age of 19. And from that day, um, I loved being in the Air Force, but also I had to pretend to be somebody I wasn't. I was literally living a double and treble life at times just to fit in with, with what society said was normal. Back then, as I mentioned, you know, as mentioned earlier on, it's LGBT History Month this month. Now, during 1988, up until 2003, there was a, a ruling called Section 28, and it meant that schools weren't able to, schools and local authorities weren't able to promote, talk about, educate people within within the LGBTQ community um, and that was part of the government's ruling. So while I was in the Air Force I did my tra basic training uh, at Swinderby then I went to Manston in Kent and then I went to RAF Chivna in North Devon. Now when I was in the Air Force I was literally having to live as I say a double treble life so there was times where I would be in the Air Force and pretend to be sort of all sort of, uh, sort of masculine um, and then come back to Manchester and just be myself. I, I ended up getting into a relationship and uh, when I was 20 and the girl I was seeing at the time fell pregnant and we got engaged on my 21st birthday. Unfortunately, she had a miscarriage a few weeks later, so we broke the engagement up. But also there'd been a, there was an aircraft crash at RAF Chivna. Uh, it was a Hawk aircraft, the same as the Red Arrows, uh, that crashed on the runway. Now, with that, I ended up getting on top of the fuselage, breaking down the main flame mass and climbing on top to rescue the pilot. I had to pull the ejection canopy, uh, get on top and got him out. Unfortunately, he died 11 days later. But because of that, I was given a good show award, but also given the British Humane Society Bronze Award for bravery because at any time that seat could have ejected. Now, I carried on with my RAF career. I went to Belize, um, then went to Henlow in Bedfordshire, did quite a lot of secondary duties. I ended up doing the London Marathon a couple of times, raising money for uh, Anthony Nolan Bone Marrow Trust, and again, other charities. And I then went over to Ascension Island, which is in between here and the Falklands. And whilst I was there, I got involved with the Combined Services Entertainment, and I was just, I was just so engrossed with, with, with everything I was doing in the Air Force. And in 1996, I was awarded with, as part of the Queen's Birthday Honours List, I was given a Commander in Chief's Commendation. Now, at the same time, I was now coming up to 24 and I just had to be me. I just felt that I was constantly lying to everybody. I just felt that I wasn't able to be my true self. Um, I was, as I say, loving the Air Force, uh, and then I, I ended up telling my mum again, and this time I also told my dad that I was gay. And it was strange because it was probably one of the first times that I remember having a hug and a kiss off my dad. And he just told me, look, son, no one told me how to live my life. I'm not going to tell you how to live yours. Uh, just be careful. So I ended up properly coming out to my family in November 1996. And I was still in the Air Force. In January of 97, uh, my papers came through. I got my promotion, uh, which was unheard of. So normally you'd be in for about nine to 12 years. I'd already signed up for 12 years. Um, I had exemplary service. I'd got all these uh, awards and accreditations. So the Air Force were very pleased and proud to sort of have me, have me there and to sort of promote me. However, I then started to see a lad in Manchester and he ended up telling the Air Force that I was gay. I then got took into a personal services flight uh, where the officer commander was there. There was the RAF police and there was a, a padre who's, who was the vicar. And they just sat me down and said, SAC Austin, do you have homosexual tendencies? Now for that split second, I paused and wondered if, I, if I'd have said no, 
I know that they would have just said, thank you very much, but we just need to check. However, they asked again and I burst into tears because that split second, my life changed completely. Um, I lost, they told me that I was, my services were no longer required. They told me that I could have gone to military prison and that was only in 1997. I could have gone to military prison for six months just for being gay. I lost all my friends. We didn't have social media back then. We didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have, we didn't even have much sort of internet at the time or, or emails. So all my contacts were gone straight away. I was marched off the camp within about 10, 15 minutes and literally with a sort of thrown out of the camp gates. And it was hard, it was tough um, because I didn't understand just because of my sexuality why I should lose my job for it. Even though I knew that that was the ruling, I didn't think it had any impact on the work that I did. Because when I joined the Air Force, I didn't want being gay to, to define me. So anyway, I challenged it. I challenged the, the letters. I challenged everything that came through. And I wrote to Tony Blair, who was the Prime Minister at the time. I wrote to uh, Graham Stringer, who was my MP. I wrote to the MOD, all of which just came back with the same sort of response saying that uh, being, being a homosexual in the Air Force wasn't acceptable. And the fact that uh, in accordance with uh, their, their, their current rules and regulations, uh, I was incompatible to service life. So I was administratively discharged. I was told I couldn't wear my medals again. I was told that I couldn't re represent the RAF at a garden party that I was supposed to go to. And as I say, that was back in 1997. So during that time, I then ended up going into, I went to stack shells in Asda, in, in, um, in Bury. Did that for a few months, then moved over to, to open the new store in Hume. And, and I enjoyed it, it was good. Uh, but at the same time, I had applied for Greater Manchester Fire Service. Now, at the time, I, I was still suspended when I applied to Greater Manchester Fire Service. So I then didn't tell them the reason why I'd been kicked out of the Air Force until they sent me my contract. So once I got my contract for Great Manchester Fire Service, I then told them, but then they told me that um, they don't have gay people in the fire service. There's no, there's no gays there at all. And that this wasn't right. So I was like, well, I've just been discharged from the RAF uh, because of it. Um, so then I was the first openly gay person to go into Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. However, they had no diversity and equality. Uh, and I was told that I wasn't able to, to tell other people, other recruits about my sexuality because they said it would have an impact on the work that they do. Now, I managed to keep this quiet for around about three weeks and in the end ended up telling them and the lads were fine with it. It was the hierarchy. It was the officers above who had a massive issue with it. Um, I think because they, they, they perceived that it wasn't something that, that being gay within the fire service was, 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 was right. So they anyway, challenged it and they then put a husband and wife team together who happened to know someone who was gay. And they then went around to all the different stations that I could go to, to have a conversation, to, to try and let people know that I was joining, I was coming in and that, you know, that I had to be treated with respect. Now, that was a bit odd because, you know, I'd just come from the Air Force and I, I knew about banter and it just seemed a bit over the top uh, that they were doing that. Uh, great that they were looking at diversity and equality, but this was 1998. Anyway, I lasted for about 18 months. I just didn't like the job. I joined for all the wrong reasons. I joined because I felt that I had let my family down. I felt that I'd let a lot of people down. So I then, uh, then was left in uh, after 18 months and I set up my own promotions and events company. And I had that, I set up Oz Promotions. I had that between 1999 and 2010. Uh, and before that, and what, what we was doing with that was just like, it was it was basically doing a lot of promotion work, hand-to-hand -hand distribution, uh, going into supermarkets, doing demonstrations. And it was brilliant. I had a really good time doing it. I employed a lot of people and we launched the Metro newspaper in Manchester when that came out in 1999. Now, also at 99 and 2000, I came across a competition called Mr. Gay UK. Now I won Mr. Gay Manchester in 99 and 2000, 
and came second overall in 2000. And but then I thought it made me realize how important it was to have some representation because all you would see on the TV and in the media and in the, in the press was everything was negative or it was you're really someone camp a bit like you Sean Tully's in Coronation Street now uh, a bit like Owen Wynne Evans love him to bits uh, the weatherman from BBC uh, but really camp really uh, flamboyant and that wasn't who I was I could be uh, flamboyant but that wasn't who I was so I wanted to normalize being gay and what I mean with that is because there's gay people, there's lesbians, there's, there's LGBTQ plus in all communities and all societies. And for me, it was about the fact that just being yourself and being being able to be your true self. And just because of your sexuality, that shouldn't have an impact on your work. It shouldn't have an impact on, on things that you do. So I then did it a bit like a, a campaign. So I then sort of came together, uh, did it like a, as an election campaign, went around, spoke to people, you know, I'd been in the Air Force, stat shells, I'd been in the fire service, I had my own company. So it was about normalising being gay. And I won it in 2001. At the same time, I did an article for a magazine called Attitude. And I talked about uh, the, the work that I'd done within the RAF, the fact that how I'd been discharged, because it wasn't until 2000, on the 12th of January 2000, that it was legalized for being for, for LGBT, uh, sorry, LGB uh, people to serve in the armed forces. If you were trans, uh, people were okay with that because people went through their transition in, in 99. So they came to me and sort of trying to look, the RAF came to me to see how they could recruit gays and lesbians in the RAF. So we had a couple of, a lot of uh, discussions and in 2004, the Royal Air Force marched in the very first Pride Parade, and that was in Manchester. Now, um, if you look at any history on the, the armed forces, they'll always say it was 2008, and they'll always say it was in uh, London. Uh, but And that was when all three services came together. So it was 2004, and I feel really proud that I was able to sort of help make that change uh, for people to feel comfortable to be able to march in a Pride Parade, and especially from our armed forces. I then got involved in local politics and because I wanted to make a difference. I was constantly living, well, I was living in the city centre, but constantly complaining about people parking in cycle lanes, the, the fact that that much litter, the fact that the state of the canals, um, you know, the usual things that just sort of get on your nerves on a daily basis. So I then stood for Burnage in South Manchester. And in 2011, I managed to secure the seat with a 1600 majority and became the, the, the Labour councillor for Burnage. While I was on the council, I then realised that, you know, when Manchester used to lead the way, and it was about being again, being yourself. So I then stood to be the LGBT lead for, for gay men in Manchester, and I got that during the time that I was on the council. Then at the same time, I realised that we have a Lord Mayor who's there to represent the city. 800,000 people at the time um, to be the figurehead and to lead when it came to civic events because all I could see on, on the wall in the town hall was that someone who was 65, 70 plus, uh, white hair, looked a bit like the fat controller out of Thomas the Tank Engine. So I put myself forward to be Lord Mayor and in 2016 I became the youngest uh, Lord Mayor and the first openly gay Lord Mayor. And the reason why I, I put that out there was because I wanted to have a voice. I wanted to stand up for people. I wanted to make a difference to get people talking about equality, to get people talking about the LGBTQ plus community across Manchester, across Greater Manchester and across the Northwest. So being openly about it, um, because I don't believe that in 124 year history before that, that someone wasn't gay before me, just not open about it. So during that year, I wanted to make sure that we were fighting for equality. And I worked a lot with a, a lot of the charities and the organisations like the LGBT Foundation, the Proud Trust, uh, Albert Kennedy Trust, and looked at different ways that we can get into to different communities. I had the pleasure of going into a lot of schools. And I went into temples, mosques, synagogues, places where I didn't think that I'd be able to have a voice. But it was about one thing I realised straight away was the fact that there was LGBTQ plus people in, in all communities. And again, it was about the fact of highlighting the fact that in the workplace 
and in skills that people should be and be allowed to be themselves because you're only going to get the best out of people if you are your true self. Um, one of the proud moments was leading the Pride Parade in Manchester and the, the robes should normally be red but I had someone make them uh, pink for me to lead the Pride Parade and I felt very proud because I'd marched it 15 years earlier as Mr Gay UK and now being the Lord Mayor of Manchester and being able to sort of show how far we've come in such a relatively short time. Met many people, I'm really proud of that photograph, uh, meeting William and Kate and also just meeting everyday people as well and meeting, you know, some mornings I'd be out doing litter picks, we'd be doing dinners, there'd be, there'd be a mix of things that we could do. But one thing that I, I made sure that I did all year was, was fighting for LGBT rights and for fighting for, for equality. Because it doesn't really matter um, whether you're what, what your gender, what your sexuality, what your race, what your creed, what your colour. It's about respect and it's about we're all human beings and it's about respecting each other for just being ourselves. In 2018, I received an honorary doctorate from Bolton University for my services to LGBT community uh, and also for, for charity. And at the same time, the LGBT Foundation and various other organisations came together across Greater Manchester to bring together the LGBT Action Plan, to look at the inequalities within communities, to look at making sure that workplaces were acceptable and fully um, on board when it came to equality and diversity. And, and it was about making sure that workspaces catered for everybody. Um, Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, then asked me and appointed me to be the LGBT advisor across Greater Manchester and to himself. Obviously, I agreed, um, but I also said that I would only do it if we had uh, a panel and that was made up of people across Greater Manchester within the LGBTQ plus spectrum. And part of that was then looking at the services that we had across Greater Manchester to make sure that there was services and there was support for everybody across the whole of Greater Manchester and not just in Manchester itself. The fact that in Manchester we look at everything in London and say about it being London centric, whereas if you live in Wigan, Old and Thameside, sometimes you think everything happens in Manchester, but it's not. We need to work together across Greater Manchester. And part of that was I ended up uh, setting up a group with Pro Manchester to look at bringing uh, various uh, businesses together across the public, the private and the third sector to make sure that, you know, we're working collaboratively together. In, tw in 2019, this was uh, a campaign for football versus homophobia. This is Altrincham Football Club. And this was the first time that a football club had played in a rainbow kit. This this made history because of the fact that we had to go through the FA. Uh, I worked with them to sort of get this to go through. I'm really proud of the moment uh, to have a football team of mainly cis white males supporting um, the LGBTQ plus community uh, with television coverage. And as I say, it, it sort of went worldwide, the photograph and to sort of support, show support. In businesses, it's really important to have networks. It's really important to, to have support uh, and peers around you, supporting you. And there's very there's a lot of companies that do that. Uh, this is Talk Talk, and it's about allyship. It's about the fact that, you know, if you hear anything or see something that you don't agree with, you need to call it out. Um, we've just had um, Hate Crime Awareness Week. And at the same time, you know, hate crime, it's not about sort of, calling someone names, it's about how it hurts people and how it can have an effect on people's lives. So allies are really, really important. You'll see over Pride Month and when we have uh, Pride Parades that people end up doing this, what I call rainbow washing, um, putting branding on there to support our communities. That's great, but they need to properly support our community and they need to make sure that they're not just doing it to, to make money. Because for me, uh, it's about permanent visibility. As you'll see in Wagon Mamre in St Peter's Square, permanent visibility is, for me, is permanent acceptance. They've had that there now for about five years and I think it's great. I think it sends a clear message to people. Uh, and when you go in there and you buy something off a particular table, 10% of the profits go to an LGBT charity. In 2019, I was made a 
uh, Deputy Lieutenant of Greater Manchester. And what that means is we have uh, the Lieutenant, we have the Lord Lieutenant, Sir Warren Smith. He represents the Queen and the Royal Family whenever there's any visits to Manchester or to Greater Manchester. And I'm one of the deputies. And we also look at the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. We look at citizenship. We, we give uh, presentations out. And in 2020, I received uh, the OBE um, for my services to uh, the charity, to LGBTQ plus communities and equality. And I was really proud of that moment, but it wasn't about me. It was about the fact of all the people who've supported me over the years and made that happen. And the fact that um, being able to go and support various charities and, and make a difference. So it's about making a difference. And that's why I say it's very much about the people who supported me over the years. And for the last two years, um, I've also been involved with another charity called Fighting With Pride to look at the injustice that was done to RAF veterans and well, to uh, any military veterans pre-2000. And because even though now, when you've got the RAF, you've got the Navy, you've got the the uh, the Army, they've all, you know, they really strive with, with equality. They've, you know, they really have a lot of passion there. And the thing is, though, but they've, they seem to have not bothered about what happened before that, and they seem to have lost the people. Um, you know, we had our medals taken off us. We, we lost our jobs. We lost pensions. And it's about putting those wrongs right. So I've been working with them and we're getting somewhere. We, you know, we're really sort of managing to achieve what we're doing. So even though we've, we, it seems like, you know, I, it was what, 24 years ago, I got kicked out of the Air Force. Then I think we've come a long way, but it's about making sure that we're, we're fighting for equality and we're fighting for, for what we need to do. Now, in the workspace, I've since 2010, after I finished with Oz Promotions, I set up VA Clean. It's a cleaning company and we do the communal areas of apartment blocks. There's myself and my business partner and we have roughly about 30 staff and we cover about 40 different venues. Um, I, you know, I just want everyone to, to be themselves at work. So we have a complete mix of people and it's really important that people, as I say, can be their true selves and bring themselves to work. Now, in the workspace and at schools, um, people need to be themselves and that is the crucial element here and it's about the fact of whatever you do you know I said before you know we're leaving school there's always extra apprenticeships there's always something that people can do to, to get further up that ladder so it's about being yourself so that's um, the presentation I'm going to hand back now um, to the to the main screen so if anyone's got any questions I'll, I'll leave that over to yourselves Thanks so much. That was absolutely amazing. I really, really enjoyed listening to that and I hope everybody else did. Um, such a very honest and personal journey that you've shared with everybody there. So thank you. Um, such a lot of challenges and distress that you had to deal with, but you've done so, so much positive work to increase awareness and to break down all those very difficult barriers and the, the, the unfortunate bigotry that you had to experience. So, yeah, fantastic. I'm just going to have a look, see if there's any questions coming. I've just popped in the chat, Carl. I don't know if you can see. I've popped a couple of um, links there in terms of um, LGBT um, kind of links for advice or information or support in Manchester. So we've got the Proud Trust and we've got the LGBT Foundation. Is there any other obvious young people based um, kind of groups or organisations that somebody people could go and get more information from that you're aware of? Yeah, you've got 42nd Street. That's um, right, yeah. You've got Albert AKT, which is Albert Kennedy Trust, um, for people who are struggling to come out. There's also Mermaids for, for people who, who may be sort of trans, non-binary, gender fluid. Yep. And, it, you know, the, the LGBT Foundation do manage to do a lot of the signposting as, as the Proud Trust. So they're the, the sort of key ones that I'd always sort of support and, and, and push to make sure that that people do get the, the right information that, that, that they're looking for. Now, I think for a lot of people, I think pronouns uh, are quite key at the moment because I, you know, I always start with mine being he, him, his. I could be there or they or them. And I think one thing, especially for, for younger people and for people in work, pronouns are really important that, that they feel that they can use them because then you're not being misgendered and you're not sort of, you know, it's not about the individual, it's about other people. So I think it's important when people are spoke, speaking and introducing themselves when they're doing anything and sort of do that, that they do use pronouns, 
But at the same time, they need to feel comfortable to do that because I don't want people to feel that they're having to come out or they're being outed. OK, fantastic. In terms of your own experience, which you described um, to us there, really some really quite unfortunate and sad situations that you had to deal with. Who, if you could have gone over that, that sort of period again and done it differently, who would you would have spoken to? Who would you have reached out to? Or who would you encourage young people now that well, you can speak to? Well, the, the, that was it because, um, you know, I did try and come out to my mum, but she kept saying it's a phase you're going through. And I see the question there was, how old were you when you realised you were gay? I, I think I realised, looking back, I was probably around about seven, five, six or seven when I realised. Um, but it wasn't something that you would accept and not something that people would ever talk about back then. Whereas I think it's different now because I think people, you know, it's it's acceptable. It is normal to be gay. It is absolutely normal to be yourself. Um, and I, if I'd have had the opportunity at schools to, to if they'd had a, an LGBT group or club or organisation, or if, you know, even if you thought there was a teacher who was gay, then you could have spoke to them. But as I say, in, in, in during 1988 up until 2003, that was illegal for schools to do that and i and i feel that the government have a lot to blame for, for people of a certain age that are suffering with with certain parts of mental health and well-being because they were able to be themselves and have that conversation because that made, made a massive difference to, to their education to their learning because i you know i especially in schools we like what well, one thing i'll bring up now is about the fact of school uniform uh, they have like well, some of them still have a boys uniform and a girls uniform I don't understand why it should just be a uniform. Uh, there should be skirts, there should be blouses, there should be shirts, there should be trousers, and people should feel comfortable to wear whatever they want to wear. They shouldn't be made to wear um, something they don't feel comfortable. We, as adults, wouldn't go to work wearing something we don't feel comfortable in. So why should we make young people do that? Yeah, no, it's a really good point, actually. Any more questions there? No. Just going on to, um, you were talking there about how, um, you know, unnecessary comments, how hurtful they are, how inappropriate they are, how um, how we shouldn't tolerate kind of inappropriate comments or bullying or name calling. In the workplace, who would you go to or who would be the first person to go and discuss something like that with in terms of um, feeling bullied or in a situation you shouldn't feel you're in in the workplace? Who yeah. should somebody go to? Well, first of all, I would like to think that if it, if it was happening, you could speak to that individual and say, look, well, why, you know, what, why are you making those comments or why are you saying this? Then if that doesn't work, then go to the line manager, the, the person who's who's above that person, explain that. And then to HR, because I think in this day and age, there is no employer, there is no employer that would allow or tolerate any sort of um, bullying, um, name calling, because because of the, the the different acts and the rules that we've now got within within the employment law, there is no way that an employer could do that. So if, if someone went to them and said that, then action would have to be taken. Uh, I think we've come a long way in that within within the workplace. The fact that HR would 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 come down heavily on that, and people would quite easily lose their jobs if someone made a um, a, a racial comment or a, a comment about someone's sexuality or gender, then they deserve to lose their jobs. And that would be going through going through the HR procedure. Definitely. Thank you. Any more questions? I don't think we have any more questions here, Carl, but I think it's probably worth saying this because we did a, a very similar session last week with um, Jack Sefion, who I'm sure you, you yeah. know, um, is that, you know, there might be young people that out there um, who would like to ask a question but they're a bit fearful to ask a question or they'd rather not do it for the fear of obviously being called out or people making comments. So I'm not going to push people to ask a question but I think it's important that if you do have questions that you sort of act on the information and the advice that, that Carl's very um, given us very well this morning. As I say I've put a variety of links in the Q&A there um, obviously, you can go online, GMAX. We have a whole range of different um, advice and signposting um, options within the GMAX website as well. So if people don't feel they can ask today, do please go and have a look if you'd like to find out more information. Um, and that's probably the best way to go. Is there anything else you'd like to, to add, Carl, before we bring it, bring it to a close? 
I suppose just really with regards to the, you know, for people, um, for anybody who's out there and they're sort of either listening to this or or whatever sort of what whatever plans they want when it comes to to uh, work is be but really I mean this just be yourself um, I wish I wish I'd had the careers opportunity that that people have got now I remember I actually wanted to be either a window dresser or a shop fitter um, but then when I went to my careers uh, advisor it was literally a case of you know, there was just nothing at all. It was like, okay, so the, there was no support. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't even um, bothered about people back then. And, and people never really spoke about um, going to college or university back then. So it's, there's, there's so much more for people now. But don't let whatever grades you get stop you trying to do what you want to do and and be who you want to be and, and just be yourself. Um, how did being gay affect me, affect my school life? I, su I suppose... Um, because I knew I was different and because of the fact that there was no one to talk to, I suppose it did have an effect, but I, it wasn't something that, you know, we did get bullied back then, but it was very different. Um, and I, well, all I mean by that, it, it was name calling back then and the fact that it was different times and you just accepted it. Uh, I ended up, so I was a bit of a loner. I went from... I, I'd mix with various different groups, so I didn't have a, I didn't have a core group of friends. I'd sort of dip in and dip out with different people uh, throughout my whole school uh, time, and that's from primary school, secondary school, um, right the right the way through. So I didn't have a, a you know, I didn't have um, a set of core friends, but I sort of dipped in and dipped out, and I, I went to various different. If there was a an, an after school club, I'd sort of go to that just to sort of, because in a bit of an oddball, you, it, it, it was that sort of way in a, in a sense. But, you know, and, and, and people say, you know, if, if my mum had, if my mum had accepted me being gay before going in the Air Force, you know, my life would be completely different now because I wouldn't have gone into the Air Force. I wouldn't have got kicked out of the Air Force. And I think, I know I said that I joined the Air Force, even though I knew because I didn't want being gay to define me. I think being kicked out of the Air Force for being gay defined me because it made me it put the fire in my belly to to try and fight for equality and fight for people's rights and to make sure that change happened and you know yes it took three years for that to go through for the equality act uh, for 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 it to be deemed illegal to, to to be kicked out of the armed forces and if i look at the work we're doing with fighting with pride you know there was people before me that, that was, was still was fighting for that fight so it's about the fact of campaigning and, and and just doing what you feel is right for other people. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, then um, I think we're going to bring it to a close because we've not got any more questions coming through. But once again, Carl, thank you so, so for so, so much for that personal and honest account. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will be able to draw some parallels with some of the things that you've said today and hopefully be able to act on some of the information advice that you've given to us. So pleasure. that all that leaves me. Sorry, Carl. Go on. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having oh, me. No. It's really, I think, it makes a massive difference these sort of uh, events. It really, really does. It really does. And I, I went to high school at around the same time that you did, and the changes that have taken place are just amazing, um, and absolutely necessary. And, and and thank you to to you for doing that and breaking down some of those really difficult barriers. I know it's not something that happens overnight, but you, you've done so much to make it the environment that it is now for, for a young person to come out. So thanks once again. Thanks to Tom as well. Sorry, Tom, I didn't give you a mention at the beginning. Tom was my colleague from yes. the bridge team who sort of followed the tech. Sorry, Claire, there's one, there's one question that's just come in. Oh, and right, okay. Uh, and I think it's a really valid point, this one. So it says, when you were in a relationship with a woman, did you still feel gay or were you unsure? Um, I felt, what, what was wrong about what I was doing then was the fact that I was trying to do what society said was right. So, yes, I was in a relationship with, with the woman uh, when I was in my early 20s, uh, even though I knew it wasn't right. It, I was trying to hide behind the fact of what society said was normal because people didn't accept gay people for being who they were. And I said earlier on, one of the reasons why I ended up not wanting to be gay at that early age 
was the fact that I wanted to get married and have children. Now, all that aside, um, I'm really pleased that we've, we've, we've campaigned for so long and we've managed to now get equal rights for same sex couples. We've got the same rights for to having children. And for something that I, I, I wanted to do at an early age and then thought it wasn't possible because of the fact that it wasn't in law. Um, I am now married. I've been married for seven years. I've been together with Simon since 2004. And we have our own biological daughter, Willow, who's coming up to three in April. So that's about change. That's about the fact that what difference um, we can do. Now, uh, there's still a lot of people out there that are in relationships with women who still feel unsure because it wasn't accepted, especially for older people. And you know, I think that that's something we need to need to remember as well for other people that, you know, I know quite a lot of older gay people who come out when they either split with their wives at a late age or unfortunately the wife passes away. Um, so there are still people out there like that, but that was the way that society was. So really, really important question. That's thank you for highlighting that one. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. OK. Yep, yeah, sorry, just checking the Q&A there, there wasn't any further questions. So yeah, once again, on behalf of um, Bridge GM um, and GMCA, thank you so, so much for your time this morning, Carl, and for your presentation. I actually couldn't see it, but I'm really interested to look at it later on. And we'll make sure that that, is, um, that goes on to our YouTube channel, where young people can come back and have a look at that at your leisure. And obviously, just a reminder about GMAX, where there's a whole range of different sort of inform information, advice and guidance for young people. Um, hope everyone enjoys the rest of their Monday and look forward to seeing you again soon on another Meet Your Future call. Thanks everybody. Bye now.